This is your main man, RJ, from the Ringside Rant, heard only on the Visionaries Wrestling Network. So go over and subscribe across all your major platforms, iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and Stitcher, to hear every great interview I have every Monday on the Visionaries Wrestling Network. Go over and follow the show's page on Twitter, at underscore Ringside Rant. Follow the network's page, at BizWrestleNet. And, as always... Embrace the vision. Hello, friends. This is Spencer Love, your host of Over the Top Rope on the Wind Column Sports Network. Don't forget you can head to windcolumnsports.ca for all of your previews, reviews, and breaking news from the world of wrestling, be it your major promotions or from the great province of Alberta, Canada. Now, back to Sounds of Struggle with your hosts, Chris Parrish and Manaya. With episode 96 of The Sounds of Struggle, I am Chris Parrish, and I'm actually by myself this week as my Nike is celebrating to the moon because, well, I'll let him explain next week, but let's just say he's got his precious back. Um, so, as regards to last weekend's Monster Pro Wrestling show, I'm going to put that on hiatus until next week. Just so Maniac and I can both talk about it. Um, I'm actually going to try to talk about very little wrestling this week. Because it's something that Maniac and I are... uh, Something that brought us together. So I'm going to let him and I discuss uh, the Super Super Showdown in Melbourne, Australia. uh, As well as WWE Evolution predictions. um, As well as kind of just, you know, our thoughts of... You know, just, you know, what's going on in Raw, SmackDown, NXT, and 205 Live, I guess is, I don't know, can you call it 205 Live now? It's not even live anymore, it's on Wednesdays, so, uh, not too sure. But, uh, there are a couple things that I want to just talk about, and one of those things I want to talk about is the fact that the uh, NHL season is uh, back and underway because uh, the Edmonton Oilers played uh, their first uh, game uh, against New Jersey Devils in Sweden, of all places. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool to see the Edmonton Oilers play in Cologne, Germany, which um, I personally have actually attended a game there. Uh, My real-life brother... And I actually went down to Oktoberfest and saw the Cologne Sharks play, uh, I want to say seven or eight years ago, um, and it was pretty cool. Uh, this, the arena is just amazing. We were shocked with, uh, how big the concourse was. Um, we were pretty, uh, taken back with the, the fan base there, um, it's, exactly like what they said was a soccer crowd in a hockey arena um and one of the things I thought was pretty cool was uh their beer girl pretty much had a proton pack uh full of booze which was a little bit of alright uh but they also gave you when they dispersed the alcohol they gave it in like a little pitcher so if anybody remembers back in the day when they went to grandma's house and she had those floral pitchers yeah imagine little mini ones of those uh yeah and that's pretty much what we got and what was cool is i, I want to say they were about three euros three or four euros a beer and uh if you actually brought back the cup to one of the desks on the concourse, you would get a euro back per cup, which I thought was really cool. 
So, yeah, and then on the back of each seat actually had a kind of like a hanger so you can just make your mountain of empty pitcher of uh, beer. So, yeah, we uh, we drank many, many euros. Um, and then when we drank the many, many's, we had many, many more because, well, let's face it, we're in Germany. We were there for Oktoberfest. If you thought we were sober, then you need to get your uh, facts straight about just exactly who we are. Um, so, yeah, going back to the Sweden game, um, there wasn't much really to talk about. I personally actually... Uh, didn't really feel like watching the whole game because it kind of was that bad, I thought. Um, the Oilers did lose 5-2, and I don't know. Uh, the early ass, or the early uh, ass- assessment, I think, about the Oilers is that I think our secondary scoring has to come alive or else it's going to be a long season. I believe our defense is going to be among some of the worst in the league if they don't pick it up. Um, but I also think when it comes to defense, the Oilers need to play better team defense. So that means the forwards have to do their job in the D zone as well as the defense. Um, because if that doesn't happen, I mean, you're going to make your goalie look really bad. And I kind of fell for Cam Talbot a little bit in that game because he was not as bad as the 5-2 uh, uh, score indicated, but I mean, when you got no help, it doesn't make it uh, very easy for you, and uh, I'll be the first one to say, there's a couple goals that, you know, you probably could put on him, and he'd probably even say that, you know what, I should have had him, but I mean, at the end of the game, I mean, the, when the other team scores more than you, you got to find, uh, you, you kind of got to go back on the tape and you got to see what you did wrong and you got to correct some things. So I'm hoping that was, you know, just nerves. No, we did have a few uh, young guys of, uh, you know, the Evan Bouchard playing his first NHL game. Uh, you had Kyler Yamamoto playing his first game since pretty much, what, October of last year. I don't know if he actually played into November, but if he did, then, I mean, it's still been 11 11 months to a year since he last played an NHL regular season game, so um, what I did like about the Oilers is that they actually used the body a lot. Uh, They were very, I don't want to say aggressive, but they were taking their uh, opportunities when a body check came and they were throwing the body. Uh, They were playing the man, and I actually did enjoy that. Just there was a lot more breakdowns, um, and that usually came with long shifts. So, yeah, if the Oilers can, uh, you know, just make changes on that aspect, um, I also like to see them get off to a better start. I mean, there's a lot of games last year where, uh, within the first minute or two, the, the other team got that early goal, and I think the Oilers really need to start games a little bit better, a little bit faster, be a little bit more aggressive, and I would love to see them being the team that scored within the first minute or two, Um, because you don't want to play catch-up right away, Um, you're just not, you can almost get off on the wrong foot right away, and that's just not a good sign, Um, so yeah, that's my early indication on the Oilers, I mean, there's only been one game. Um, when this comes out, I believe it's Thursday, which I think is their second game against Boston, which uh, already the Oilers are making some news there because apparently uh, the hotel they're staying at, there's been like a union strike, and just to get into the hotel, they had to cross the picket lines, and something I just, I honestly shake my head about because I just don't understand what the Oilers as a team are supposed to do. They were already kind of told that was her hotel um but if you know if this was going to be a, a thing and if the NHL was I don't know if they've made a big thing about it but you know if they did then maybe they should have done a little bit better of a job of providing them a hotel that has a union strike against it that's just my two cents um but I mean at the end of the day you got to do your job you got to play the game and you got to do what you know you're told and kind of tell you where to stay so you got to stay there so I don't 
I don't see what the hockey team is supposed to do in that situation, so I hope they don't get blasted at all, because it's not really the right thing to do. Um, been looking kind of just at the points uh, for individual players, and uh, you know, Jonathan Taze, you know, puts up a, a high trick in, uh, you know, I believe in his uh, first game, so he had a very good start to his season. Um, just good because he didn't have a great year last year so it's nice to see uh, him pick it up I mean he's one of my favorite players he's definitely I know one of Maniac's favorite uh, hockey players so uh, I'm sure he's very happy that uh, the captain to his uh, beloved Blackhawks has you know started the year off a good uh, good foot so I mean that's good um We've already been seeing a little bit of r rivalry between Austin Matthews and Patrick Kane as they were uh, trying to outdo one another with their celebrations as it was just we score a goal and put our hand towards our ear, making a Hulk Hogan proud, I guess, um, as long as they don't get caught on tape doing something they shouldn't be doing. Um, hopefully Austin Matthews doesn't because I think Patrick Kane might already have done some things he doesn't really feel too proud of in his lifetime uh, but we're not going to get into that um, the, but going through the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, we saw John Tver is already getting a hat trick as well um, so looks like their offense is you know doing exactly what they should do be very explosive be very prolific I guess in that sense of scoring a lot of goals creating a lot of chances However, it's their defense that is, you know, raising the concern because they are, they haven't won every game yet. And even though they're putting up six goals, there are, you know, some games where, you know, they're, they're letting seven across. So that's not a good sign. That's not good team defense. As much as it'd be cool to see the 80s ba hockey back in the sense of no defense, you still need defense in today's game to win. Um... And I'm a firm believe, believer that defense wins championships. Um, so, yeah. Um, Pittsburgh Penguins uh, revealed their third jersey, and they kind of went with, uh, I want to say, kind of a, a mixture of a few looks. And it's kind of mainly yellow. Um, I personally wanted those old yellow uh, style jerseys kind of similar to the style they have now but back in the 90s they had a yellow version of it I was kind of hoping they would just kind of go back to that um and in a, in a way they kind of did I mean there's very there's a lot of similarities between uh the design and kind of how the colors are lined up but um it's also kind of done in a kind of a way where, I mean, you have, you have your numbers that are, instead of on your sleeve, they're on your shoulder. Uh, I've personally never been a real big fan of that. Um, I know the Oilers did it a couple years ago when they had those orange uh, third jerseys. Now, they've kind of taken that off from the shoulders and they've put it back on the sleeves, which I think is a little bit more traditional. Um, I'm a very big stickler uh like nah, stickler I guess on jerseys um cause I also don't like how thin the the letters like the C's and the A's are for the alternate and the, and the captain um that's kinda just weird I mean I've always thought it was weird that Montreal has such a tiny A and C on their jersey um I'm not asking for a gigantic letter it's just you know something that doesn't make it look stupid I guess um, but at the same time Montreal it's kind of a classic look for them it's you know what they're known for in the sense of those jerseys that's why they don't make many changes or they do they don't even do very if any uh, alternate jerseys so uh, yeah uh, with that said um, they did a ranking or I saw a ranking on the third jerseys to date so far and uh, St. Louis their uh, light blue throwbacks were number one. Um, I guess those are getting a lot of love because I'm not really... I don't hate them. I'm just not a giant fan of them. I don't know. I, I personally like to see some teams try something new and I thought 
uh, St. Louis was one of those teams that could have done something different and cool. Um, kind of like when they had those uh, navy blue jerseys with the arch on it. I thought it was different. I thought it were cool. Um, so I kind of enjoyed that aspect. Uh, I know Columbus kind of did the same when they got the cannons and they brought those back, which I personally love. Um, so, yeah. But I guess the uh, the throwbacks are... You know, some things just don't go out of style, I guess. So they had San Luis, number one. And one thing I didn't like was I didn't like the fact that Calgary, they rank Calgary higher than Edmonton because, in all honesty, I mean, the two go kind of hand in hand. When you think of one, you think of the other because you always think about the Battle of Alberta. So um, the fact that there is a gap between the two, I thought was different. Or I don't think it was right. Plus, I mean, that royal blue oiler jersey, I mean, come on. Maybe. me. How many jerseys in the league are honestly better looking than that? I mean, just sometimes there's just there's just a right way to do jerseys and a wrong way. Uh, you can look at Winnipeg's third jersey. That is the wrong way. Um, uh, and you look at, you know, a team like uh, Carolina who brought back the Hartford Whaler jersey. And, you know, that is the right way to go about it. Um, so, yeah. Um that's pretty much all I have with hockey. Uh, there's not really a lot to talk about. I haven't personally watched a lot of hockey this year yet. Uh, it's only within the first week. So, um, still very hard to uh, predict. Um, it looks like Washington is not hungover from last year. Um, a lot of people want to say that's not the right word to say it. I think it's the perfect word. Um, so, it'll be very interesting to see if... Um, their offense continues to be as hot as it is right now. But, I mean, again, with, uh, like I said, with Toronto, they got to be a little bit more uh, smooth on the defensive side of the puck because they, uh, if they're not careful, they're going to get bit. And they're not always going to put out six, seven goals. So they got to really watch it in those games. And they really got to, you know, bear down, especially on back-to-back -back games. Those are Those are tough ones, so... Uh, you got to be able to play some defense and be able to play those tough, like one nothing, two one type games. So, um, yeah, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm still kind of. I'm gonna give it a about another week or two before I truly make a real prediction. I want to see some teams and uh, a little bit more, and some I just want to see them. Period. Because I haven't seen a lot of certain teams yet. So, uh, before I make any true predictions of who I think is going to be in the finals uh, or who's going to be playoff teams and stuff like that. So um, I personally just want to watch, you know, a little bit more. Um, so that's about it. So, uh, yeah. Um, as it comes out with baseball, uh, the Houston Astros defeated the Cleveland Indians uh, on Sunday uh, to sweep them. And they are, you know, moving one step closer to uh, the World Series where they uh, they won last year. So um, I believe they uh, are going to play the winner of Boston and the Boston Red Sox and the Yankees who uh, got crushed. I want to say it was like 16-1 or something like that. They just crushed in Game 4. Um, I don't know if that game's happening tonight. And I'm recording on the Tuesday, so um, yeah, not too sure. I'm going to have to look into that. Uh, but yeah, they play the winner of that series, and uh, yeah, that should be a very interesting game five, if uh, there is a game five in that series. So uh, yeah, I'm not too sure if that's two one Boston or or what. I think it's I think it might be two one Boston. I think uh, I remember them saying on the on a radio station that they wouldn't be surprised if Yankees forced a game five. So I think it's two one Boston. So it looks like it's. The Red Sox and the Astros could very well be in the uh, American League Divisional Series, the ALDS. Um, and then we go to the National League. And, uh, you yeah, know, we saw the Milwaukee uh, Brewers, you know, kind of take it a little, you know. I mean, that's an interesting story, I think, because, I mean, who's ever been known to... Uh, to say that the Brewers were a powerhouse team, but uh, I mean they they swept the Colorado Rockies in three games. 
So uh, they're moving on, and I think they are playing the Dodgers. Yeah, I believe, yeah, it is the Dodgers because they won their series at three games to one against Atlanta. So um, Milwaukee against LA in the National League Divisional Series, and possibly uh, Boston and Houston. So. Uh, yeah, as of right now, the Boston is currently leading the Yankees 4-1 in the bottom of the 7th. So if they hold on, it will be Boston going up against Houston. And we have L.A. against uh, Milwaukee. And I believe that series starts on Friday. So, I mean, that should be uh, interesting. kind of hope uh, we see Houston-Milwaukee final. I think that'd be cool. Um, so, yeah. So in uh, in other sports news, I'm just pulling up my phone here because, I mean, I'm going to talk some NFL because anybody who's been listening to the podcast knows I am a giant New Orleans Saints fan and the Saints kind of played a very historic game last night on the Monday where they defeated uh, the Washington Redskins. Uh, but they also defeated them in a way where we saw Drew Brees in the first half break Peyton Manning for the lead, the solo lead for the NFL all-time passing yards. He eclipsed Brett Favre, and then with about just a little over two minutes left in the second quarter, threw a 62-yard touchdown pass to Traquan Smith to break the record and now holds uh, the record with just a little over 72,100 yards as the new king for the NFL all-time passing yards. And uh, the funny thing too is about that, that was also Trey Quan Smith's first career touchdown. Um, and he doesn't even get to keep the ball that he caught for his first career touchdown because that ball is actually in Kenton, Ohio in the Football Hall of Fame along with... Uh, Breeze's completion record football, the jersey that he wore in uh, Monday night's game. So, I mean, that's kind of a shot in the foot when you don't even get to keep your uh, first touchdown football, but uh, he got a second one later that night, so I'm sure he kept that football. Um, so, I mean, it was kind of cool that uh, that historic uh, pass not only came on a touchdown, but also went to a receiver who got his first career touchdown. So I think that, you know, in a way, I mean, that's that's a pretty special play right there. And, uh, you know, I was pretty happy to watch that. So uh, it brought me a lot of joy, uh, not only to uh, witness that, but as a Saints fan for as long as I've been a Saints fan, uh, which actually, I was, I've been a Saints fan longer than Drew Brees has been a Saints. So... The fact that I got to see Drew Brees accomplish so much in that span was pretty surreal. And I really hope he gets that full acknowledgement now moving forward as one of the top and best quarterbacks of all time. Because I do think he's in that category with the Peyton Manning, with the Brett Favre, with the Tom Brady's, with, you know, the soon-to-be Aaron Rodgers. And uh, so, um, you look at his records, I mean... He has a long book already. Uh, he's done a lot in his career. Um, I'd like to see him kind of add to that Super Bowl collection. So, it'd be nice. Um, I don't know. What do you think? If he, if uh, Drew Brees wins one more Super Bowl, is he better than Peyton Manning? I mean, or is he already? I mean, so, I mean... I mean, that that would be an interesting question. I mean, because everyone's going to say, well, Tom Brady's the best because of his Super Bowls. Um, which, okay, never ever going to take away that accomplishment because I don't know if anybody's going to going to have more rings as a player. I mean, I'm lo you're just looking at the like who has the most rings as a player. I mean, it's Tom Brady. Um, and only Tom Brady, uh, Robert Kraft, and Bill Belichick are the only three members of that franchise that have had that many rings because they were all they were all there when New England won all their Super Bowls um, and they were the only three so um, Robert Kraft is obviously the owner Belichick's the head coach and general manager Tom Brady the only player 
So, uh, very, uh, very amazing of a stat, dude, to have that many Super Bowl rings. But when it comes down to his personal, individual uh, accomplishments, I mean, a lot of those, I mean, they're just not, you know, up there with the Peyton Mannings or the Drew Brees. He's not very, he's not far off, but. I mean, he's he's fourth for the all-time passing yards. He should, I think. You know, if he plays a few more years, he I think easily will beat Brady and uh, Manning, or sorry, Favre and Manning. Um, but I don't think, as long as uh, Brees keeps playing, I don't think he'll pass Brees. So, um, Brees almost actually accomplished another stat of throwing his 500th touchdown. Uh, but he he needed four. He did get the three, and they took him out with uh, just over a minute to go. And they were on Washington 17. All they did was kneel the ball because um, they didn't want to run up the score, which I think is very respectful from a franchise. But, uh, I mean, you're one play away from your 500th touchdown. I mean, that must have been a hard, uh, hard one to say no to. But at the end of the day, I mean, kind of lived a... You live for another day. So in two weeks' time when... Uh, they play their next game. They, uh, I'm sure he'll get that. So it'll be a special night too, to get that 500th touchdown. But uh, it's, it's also nice that he uh, he did that at home. You know, in a city where he's pretty much uh, untouchable. Uh, he went there right after Hurricane Katrina. He's done a lot for the city. He's contributed a lot towards uh, the relief from the vi- for the victims of that hurricane and pretty much helped give that uh, city not only an identity but also something to get away from from all the crap that they have to do or deal with in their personal life with uh, that hurricane and the tragedy that was um, bringing a Super Bowl to that city uh, making people uh, proud to be from New Orleans again I mean that that's I mean I said it before, I think that guy, when it comes down to Drew Brees, he embodies his team's nickname, a saint. I mean, he's a saint of a human being. Um, I mean, he's just that perfect representative for that uh, football club. Um, also, a pretty touching moment that he had with his kids where uh, he is hugging them right after, and he said, see, told you, you can... Uh, do anything and you can accomplish anything in this life as long as you're willing to work for it and uh this is like minutes after he just set the the new record for all time passing yards and he's saying this to his kids uh something he's he says he he mentions every night before they go to bed um it's very uh very inspiring of a quote uh when he just did something like that so that was, I thought, very, very cool. It's, it's hard not to get a little bit uh, choked up in that thing because it was a very emotional time and very emotional uh, kind of few minutes in that game. So uh, I don't think you're a true human being if you didn't uh, get touched by that. Um, so um, in other football news... Um, we saw the Detroit Lions defeat Maniac's Green Bay Packers. Um, I don't think he'll be very happy with that, but well, he's not here, so I mean, he's not going to be upset by me unless he listens to this, which I'm sure he will. Uh, sorry, Maniac, but it's true. They did lose. Uh, we saw the Cleveland Browns win another football game. Uh, it wasn't pretty, but I mean... They won another game. I mean, they. I mean, a win's a win. Nobody's gonna remember the points you get, even though it was only twelve. They defeated the Baltimore Ravens twelve nine in overtime. Um, we also saw on the Thursday nighter we saw the New England Patriots defeat the Indianapolis Colts. Um, we saw the Buffalo Bills defeat the Tennessee Titans thirteen twelve. So another nail biter of a football game. Um, we saw Carolina. Just squeaked by the New York Giants, 33-31. Uh, Gimno got a 63-yard field goal at the end. Hit that one to win the game. I mean, what a kick. Um, Cincinnati defeated Miami Dolphins. We saw Kansas City 
defeat Jacksonville. The Jets pummeled Denver. 34-16. Um, and speaking of another pummel, Pittsburgh pummeled the Falcons 41-17. Um, we saw Minnesota squeak by the Philadelphia Eagles 23-21. We saw the LA Chargers defeat Oakland. Arizona over San Fran. The Rams squeak by Seattle 33-31. So pretty much ident the identical score in the Carolina game. And then another overtime between Houston and Dallas saw uh, Houston squeak by 1916 over the Cowboys. So um yeah, kind of just looking at now the standings there. He's, uh with that win uh by New England lost by Miami, New England uh with a 3 and 2 record is technically first spot in their division even though they are tied record-wise with the Miami Dolphins. Um only a game up on their on the other two teams, the Buffalo Bills and New York Jets. So um, nobody's running away with that one yet, which is kind of surprising seeing how the Patriots should. They're always, you know, leading that division, always winning it. So very surprising that they're only 3-2, and two, but, I mean, that is what it is. Um, and that was your AFC East. So in your AFC North, you got Cincinnati leading the pack with a 4-1 and one record, and uh, Baltimore... Is a game behind at three and two, and then both Cleveland and Pittsburgh are two two and one as they tied each other in the opening week of the season. Um, and then in the AFC South, we got a two eight tie between Tennessee and Jacksonville uh, for first spot, and then Houston a game behind at two and three for third, and then the Colts at a one and four record, and they're just having a tough go right now. Uh, they they have luck back, but they just can't seem to win any football games. And um, Yeah, so, I mean, that team has to get going or else their playoff uh, shots are going to be uh, hooped before the season even gets interesting. Um, and then the FC West, you got one of the two undefeated teams, one being the Kansas City Chiefs leading that division. Um, and they're two games up on the L.A. Chargers. Three up on the two and three uh, Denver Broncos, and uh, four games up on the one and four Oakland Raiders. So, uh, yeah, if you're a Raiders fan, whew, man, they're not uh, they're not playing very well in their last year in Oakland. So, yeah, and then that brings us to the NFC. Um, the NFC East is pretty much uh, whatever like whoever is. The biggest, I don't know, it seems, it's just a weird division because right now nobody has a winning record. Uh, Washington Redskins are technically first in there with a 2-2 two two record. Uh, Dallas, is, Dallas and Philadelphia are tied for second with a 2-3 and three record. And then you have the Giants at 1-4, so another team that needs to get it going or else, you know, their season's going to come to a close very quickly. And then in the NFC South, you got the Chicago Bears. Um, I mean, that division hasn't changed. You got Chicago still leading that division with three and one record, um, and then you got Green, Green Bay and Minnesota stuck in second spot with a two two and one record, as they tied in the second week of the season. And then you have Detroit at a two and three record. So I mean, with pretty much within a game and a half, that is separating the first first place Chicago and the last place uh, Lions. So, very tight division there. Um, and in the NFC West, you got the other undefeated team, the LA Rams, at 5-0. and um, And they have a three-game lead on uh, the second place Seattle Seahawks and uh, a four-game four lead on the uh, third and four, well, pretty much the two other teams in Arizona and San Fran who are sitting at a one and four record, uh, sitting at a one and four record is also the Atlanta Falcons, as they are sitting fourth in the NFC South uh, with a two and two record. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are third with three and one record. Carolina and with a four and one are my New Orleans Saints. So they are cruising into their bye week, winning four straight after that uh, loss against Tampa Bay, which 
If only their defense showed up, I believe they would have been a 5-0 and team. Um, that kind of hurts because, yeah, I do believe that if their defense actually was present in that game, it would have been very easy for them to be a 5-0 and team. Um, so, yeah, um, I... I, I mean, from a statistic standpoint, I mean, it's going to come down to New Orleans and L.A. As, uh, I mean, uh, Carolina still don't play because they've only played four games, whereas a lot of other teams have played with five. So, I mean, we're going to see, just from a statistic standpoint, it should come down to one of those three teams for the NFC, uh, barring... Another team. Well, I guess you can put Chicago in there. They've only played four games, and they also own a three and one record. Um, but it's the Bears. I mean, come on. Does anybody really think they're going to be like this all year? I don't. Um, so yeah. So, I mean, kind of biggest surprises for me in the NFC right now. I mean, I'm surprised with the NFC East to be honest. Nobody has a winning record. Ah, uh, that's surprising. I mean, I I didn't expect much from the Giants as they only won, I believe it was two or three games last year. Uh, I thought the Eagles would be a lot better. I thought they'd be the number one team in that division. Um, Dallas are it just seems like they're not getting anything going offensively. Uh, they lost J- their tight end in Jason Winton. They lost one of their uh, veteran receivers in Des Bryant. Um. But for whatever reason, they just can't get the ball thrown very much. So I don't know if it's a a Dax Prescott issue. Because I don't think Ezekiel Elliott's going to be the one to blame about their offense. He's doing his job. He's still one of the top running backs in the league. So, And with Washington, it's, you know, I mean, they're a 500 team right now. After four games, after a quarter of the season, they're a 500 team. So, um... It is what it is there. Um, I'm kind of surprised by the Packers and the Minnesota Vikings as well. Only uh, two wins from each team. Uh, didn't really expect Minnesota to have much of a drop-off, even though they changed the quarterback from Case Keenum to uh, Kirk Cousins. I actually thought they actually improved in the quarterback department, so... I expected them to be more of a 4-1 or 5-0 and team. And I expected Green Bay to be the 4-1, four, 5-0 and team too. So it is a little surprising that those two teams still haven't found a rhythm yet. Um, um, when it comes to the NFC West, I'm actually not surprised. Um, I'm not surprised Arizona's 1-4. I'm not surprised San Fran is 1-4. Especially that Garoppolo's out. Um, and... You know, I'm, I guess I'm kind of surprised Seattle's two and three, but I mean, I like that, seeing that team fail. So, I'm, 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 to me, that I'm okay with that. So, with the NFC South, I mean, it's it's a competitive division. I mean, if Carolina wins next week; it's a tie for first spot. So, I mean, that's not gonna that's not gonna make it any easier for my Saints, but. I mean, Carolina seems to be for real. They just, it all depends on next week if they can get that win or not. Um, so, and then Tampa Bay's 500. I mean, it'll be interesting to kind of see how that team reacts now with James Winston back as their starting quarterback. Um, they won their first two games and then they lost their next two. So, I mean, what team are you going to get in week five? That's, or sorry, in week six. Um, Because they just actually had their bye. So it'll be very interesting to see what kind of Tampa Bay team shows up. And uh, and I'm very surprised about the Atlanta Falcons. Julio Jones, uh, going into yesterday, we saw, it was a stat I saw, it was 101 different wide receivers have scored a touchdown. And Julio Jones was not one of them. So that was... That was an eye-opening stat because I thought Atlanta Falcons would be kind of where the Saints and the Panthers are. So the fact that they're one in four, um, they've already lost twenty-five percent of the games that they play this season, only after five games. So 
That's not a good thing. They have to go on a monster tear if they want to salvage this season. Um, so yeah, it'll be very interesting. And with the AFC West, I mean, I just don't see who's going to stop Kansas City right now. They look like they are legit. Um, I think the Chargers have a shot. To be honest, like it's, I don't think when you have a guy like Philip Rivers and Melvin Gordon, Keenan Allen. Like, they got weapons there. Um, I don't think they're going to go down without a fight. So, uh, it should be very interesting to see if Kansas City slips, if LA can make some ground, because I think it's going to come down to those two teams. One of those two teams will take the AFC West. So, right now it looks like Kansas City, and if somebody can uh, crack Kansas City right now, then you might be able to, you know, take them down, but... As of right now, they are uncrackable as they sit 5-0. and So, um, in the AFC South, man, that's going to be a very tough, tough one. I mean, with between Tennessee, Jacksonville, and Houston, it's just one game separating each team. Um, Jacksonville's D surprisingly got outplayed by Kansas City's last week. So, it'll be very interesting to see if they can weather the storm and if they can get the ball rolling I mean one of these teams have to go on a tear to take this division uh, and if nobody does and you're going to see this being a dogfight all the way to the end and we might see a couple eight and eights nine and sevens maybe a ten and six we, we, I mean I don't know it's just going to be a tight division if nobody wants to take the reins at all on there um and that says the same thing about the AFC East because one game separates one and fourth spot. Uh, the New England Patriots sit number one because they've defeated the Miami Dolphins. So they sit number one with three and two. But the Jets, who are sitting at number four, have a two and three record. So only one game separates um, that whole division. Um, so again, somebody has to take the reins in that division. Um, I, I think the safe money is on New England. Um, I think the safe money is not going to be on the Jets or Buffalo. I mean, they also have starting quarterbacks who uh, haven't exactly been dominant yet this season. I mean, they've had some good games, but they haven't been dominant. Um, and then with Miami, I just I just don't know if they have enough consistency in that team. So um, I think a 500 season might actually be very explainable for them as well. So. And then with the AFC North, I mean, I'm surprised with Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's technically last in that division. Um, Cincinnati's first, and kind of, I don't say I want to flip that, but I would, I would have thought by now Pittsburgh would be where Cincinnati is, and Cincinnati, you know, kind of is the Baltimore spot at number two. But I mean, right now it's it's Cincinnati, Baltimore, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and. I think Cleveland might be a 500 team. They might go 8-8, eight 9-7, and, eight, nine and seven, or even 7-8. and eight. I'm going to say that's probably how they're going to project um, in that area. I mean, obviously they have the tie, so they won't be able to have a 9-7. and seven. They might go 7-8-1 or 8-7-1 or 6-9-1 or 9-6-1, something like that. Um but, I mean, I think Pittsburgh needs to get it going. They have too many weapons. With a quarterback like Ben, with a receiving core like uh, Juju Schuster and Antonio Brown, um, you should be able to, you know, move that ball. Uh, Joseph Connor is uh, playing very well in Le'Veon Bell's absence. So, um, and then whether it's Jesse James or Vern McDonald, I mean, they got to step up. That's just... That's that's all it is. They just have to step up if they want to do any damage. The Cleveland Browns, I think you're just going to see competitive games out of them. Um, if they can make you earn that a win against them, I think they're in the right direction. Just, you know, making that identity. Like, I think uh, Baker Mayfield has proven already that he should be their number one. Uh, even if Tyrod Taylor comes back, I don't see why you would go back to Tyrod Taylor at this point. Uh, and with Baltimore, it's, they just they just have to finish these games out. 
Um, and if they don't, then Cincinnati's going to run run away. I mean, if Cincinnati doesn't get tested, they're just going to run away with this division. So um, that's kind of my my uh, prediction so far on the state of the NFL. Um, so right now it's, you know, I'm going to say it's between Cincinnati and uh, Kansas City, I think, on who's the top of the AFC. And then you got L.A. and you got New Orleans. And maybe Carolina and Chicago. Those are kind of... Well, if we're going to stick to two teams, you got New Orleans and you got L.A. So right now we're looking at L.A. Rams against the New Orleans Saints. And we're looking at the Kansas City Chiefs against the Cincinnati Bengals as your uh, final four. And I would, you know, I'm going to leave it at that because I don't want to make any other predictions. But, I mean, this is what it looks like as of right now. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of the majority of what I'm going to discuss this week. Um, so, there's not really... I mean, I'm tr- I'm trying not to talk a lot about wrestling, because like I said, I'm going to wait for Manag to come back next week, um, so he can kind of, you know, bring his thoughts into that. Uh, I'm going to talk more about, you know, just, you know, the sports that we don't really talk too much of. I mean, I'm a bigger football fan than I want to say Manag is, especially NFL. Um, I did watch the Eskimo game. Um, man, that team is uh, trending in the wrong direction. Um they are just not doing much right right now. Their defense, I felt very bad for. I thought played a very good game. But that offensive line is atrocious. Um, Riley threw three interceptions. Um, did not throw a touchdown. I mean, that, this football team has not scored a point in the fourth quarter since the Labor Day game against the Calgary Stampeders. That's not a good stat at all. And they don't. I don't think they've actually had a touchdown since the Ottawa game. Um, this offense needs to get rolling, or else they are not going to even make the playoffs. I'm not saying it's any individual fault, but that offense as a whole has to find its rhythm, has to get some confidence, and has to get that ball going because they cannot afford to have their biggest play be a last play of the game Hail Mary again which that was the case against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders um and that game was not that fun to watch I mean one touchdown all game and it was a defensive it was a pick six you had back-to-back interceptions when you thought the Eskimos got an interception to kind of take that game and all they had to do now was just manage the clock and You know, if they can, you know, get a field goal or get some points in and just eat that clock down. They were sitting in good shape. But then the pick six comes and then now they're playing catch up again. And because of that, they just couldn't, they just couldn't do anything. They did a three and out. They got the ball back, but it was only, they only had the one play after the kickoff. And it was a 72 yard Hail Mary. Um, which fell eight yards short from, from the end zone. So, I mean, that, that offense has to get the ball rolling. Um, seems like it was uh, the week for interceptions because Bo Levi Mitchell threw, I believe it was three interceptions. Johnny Menzel threw some picks. Um, just not just not a good week for the, you know, the, the quarterbacks in the CFL. Just... Uh, Interception, the week of interceptions. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's still hard because I think uh, I think Calgary has kind of come to life. Like, they're not as the they're not as dominant as they w- were in the beginning part of the season. So I, they're definitely a beatable team. I mean, they didn't play well against Montreal. They're not looking dominant right now. Um. As much as it pains me to say, it looks like the Riders actually have the momentum right now in that division. Um, and 
if they're not careful, the Edmonton Eskimos will lose that spot. Um, not only to the Riders, but they will also lose that spot to the BC Lions as well. So, I mean, they really have to watch themselves, and they really got to start, uh, you know, getting getting the ball moved on their offensive um, play. Just keep it up on the defensive game. I don't think their defense it was at all to blame in that game. Um, if you can get that effort from that D for the rest of the year, I think your D is doing something right. I think it's the offense that just needs to get it going. So, um, yeah, so that's my two cents on the CFL. Um, no, I guess we had a UFC on Saturday, and I'll kind of end the podcast with my thoughts about that. We had uh, Khabib uh, Nermov Gomendov against Conor McGregor. Um, and this fight pretty much went the way I kind of thought it would. Connor trying to keep it on the ground or keep it setting up and uh could be wanting to uh want him to take him down, which he did many times. And because of that, controlled the fight, dictated the fight, got the rear naked choke, and made Connor McGregor tap. Connor McGregor did not look that good in this fight. Um, his defense actually, I thought, improved for being in a submission thing. He actually stuffed a couple takedowns and got up when he was taken down. So it looks like his ground game is getting better. But it's just not better than the ground game of one Khabib. Um, and that was too much for him. Um, what I thought was too much was the aftermath of that fight. Because we also saw... Um, Everything just spiral, spiral out of control. Um, we saw Khabib go out of the cage to jump a corner ma- or a corner guy in McGregor's camp. I don't know if he's what he said, but apparently he was dissing his country, his religion. Uh, Khabib just took exception and went out and decided to have a second fight of the night. And then because of that, we saw Connor kind of. Almost uh, get involved. Well, actually, he did get involved. He threw a punch at one of Khabib's cornermen, and then some random friends of Khabib, I guess, jumped into the cage and started taking exception to Conor McGregor. So it just became one of those old-fashioned brouhaha's that uh, you know made it fun to watch, but it was very embarrassing in the sport. I mean, you don't want to see that at all. So Conor says he wants a rematch, but I mean. Who doesn't want to say that I want a rematch after they just got whooped? And that's what Connor did. He got whooped. So I don't know what's next for Khabib. I don't think he needs to fight Connor again. I don't think he has anything more to prove than that. Dana White didn't even want to put the title at Khabib because he thought people were going to throw stuff into the ring and more people were going to get hurt. That's how uh, intense this whole aftermath of the fight got. So I saw Tony Ferguson. He's back. Kind of back with a uh, a purpose, I guess. He uh, he won his fight um, against Anthony Pettis. Um, it was a TKO from a corner stoppage. Pettis broke his hand. So, um, there was no decisive win here. Um, so, I'd like to see those two fight again. I mean, I don't understand how Ferguson can, you know, say that he really won the fight when... Pettis broke his hand. He wants to say it was a verbal tap out, but I mean, come on. You're going to take a fight because a guy broke a hand? You're like, oh, okay, I'm better than him. Okay. I wouldn't say put that fight again, but I mean, I think if Pettis says he wants a rematch, I don't see why not. Ferguson and Khabib, that makes sense to me. Let those guys fight for the lightweight championship. Why not? Uh, Reyes, unanimous decision over, uh, St. Pru. Um, Lewis defeated Volkov with punches. KO, round three, so, um, another unanimous decision with, uh, Watterson over Heron. And in your prelims, we saw Formengo over, uh, Pettis' little brother. Uh, Luke over Turner with KO punches. Ladd over Evinger. 
TKO on punches and uh, the women's bantamweight. And then we saw Holtzman against uh, Patrick, and that ended with uh, KO on elbows. So, yeah, then what do we have here? Uh, Kunitskaya defeated Landsberg with unanimous decision. Lentz defeated Maynard in uh, the second round with a head kick and punches. And then we saw Martin defeat LaFlair in round three with a uh, head kick and punches as well. So that was your UFC 229. Obviously, the two main fights were the Ferguson Pettis, McGregor and Nurma Gomendov fight. And, you know, those those are good. No, oh, I mean, those fights lived up to the card. I believe this card, uh, sh- I don't want to say it's shattered box office, but they did set a record for most pay- or buy- pay-per-view buy rate. So... Um, a good payday for any fighters who have buy rate percentages in their contract, which I believe McGregor does. So good for him. Cormier is uh, going to be defending his uh, World Heavyweight Championship against Lewis November 3rd, Madison Square Garden. So not the Brock Lesnar fight. I don't think Lesnar can fight till January, so that's going to have to wait. So uh, yeah, UFC 230, Cormier against Lewis. That is the next one. Um, looks like they just announced that fight, actually, about three hours ago on Twitter. So, yeah, there you go. All right. Well, I mean, I think that kind of does it right now for uh, this week's episode of The Sounds of Struggle. It's episode 96. Yeah. I'll say it's the Pavel Bure, the second coming episode. See, he wore 96 for the one year. Which I think was 1996. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, yeah, follow us. Uh, follow me on Instagram at Chris at Parish, Twitter, Chris Parish. Follow Maniac at WrestleManiac on each of the Instagram and the, uh, the Twitter. Um, like us on Facebook. Friend us on Facebook. Like us on any sort of social Instagram. Make sure you uh, check out the Pivot Share. Through the back breaker media page, um, check out all the other podcasts on Backbreaker Media. Uh, double down with uh, KJ Cash. You got Total Nonstop Anarchy. You got Monday Night Shaw. You got your quick calls and all that other good stuff. So yeah, make sure you uh, subscribe to Backbreaker Media and you check out all their stuff. Check out the the Pivot Share. Pretty much. Uh, when you download this episode, just you know, go into that information uh, section below it, where they have the description, and just check everything out. Make sure you go to whatamaneuver.net, and you get all your uh, clothes that we sell there, your original tag struggle stuff, which we're kind of still working on new designs for, so I know we're taking a very long time. Um, I blame myself, as I'm the... Uh, the graphic guy, but from an idea standpoint, we just don't know what we want to say yes to right now. So uh, that's kind of where it is right now. And uh, yeah, if you get a chance, buy those retro WE shirts because for one night only, Sydney Steele and Chris Parrish are reuniting as a One World Empire on October 20th. So that'll be very fun. We'll be uh, facing off against Bradley Graham and Kyle Sebastian, known as the Adult Social Society. Better known as ASS. So, OWE versus ASS. Or if you want to say ASS versus O. We got an ass o match. Kind of funny. Uh, so yeah, I am Chris Parrish. Make sure you... Uh, Check back next week with episode 97, the McDavid episode, and we bring back Maniac. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk a lot of wrestling because we did not talk any wrestling at all this week. So we'll be uh, back with Maniac talking wrestling and make sure, just make sure you guys enjoy everything that's coming up in your area. And if you're in that Bonneville area this Saturday, uh, make sure you check out the show. I'll be f- facing off Lumberjack Larry. 
We got uh, an open challenge tag match with the Wrecking Crew. We have a triple threat match uh, between Pride, Jude Dawkins, and uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the uh, the third competitor right now. I don't have the sheet in front of me, so um, I'm just trying to remember this off by head, which is not a good thing. So, um, yeah, if you're in the Bonneville area, check out the show. Uh, I will uh, just come... Check out my Facebook for uh, details on that. And then, yeah. So for this week, I am Chris Parrish, one half of Tag Struggle. We are real. We are spectacular. We're a little bit of all right. And if you cut us, we are going to bleed Struggalicious. And that itself is a little bit more of all right. Later, bitches. When your heart's pounding out of your chest, you can feel the sick and you're running out of breath. If you're ready to run